All right, so first I just want to get started with some introductions. And my name is Bahia Simons Lane. I'm the executive director of US JDA. I'm sure that most of you know about US JDA, but just in case you don't, we're the United States Jet Program Alumni Association. We're a national 501c3 nonprofit organization. And we work to further US Japan relations by providing support and resources for the JET alumni network, individual JET alumni and the 19 JET AA chapters. If you are not yet a member of US JET AA and you're a JET alumni, please become a member. Uh, we will drop a link in the chat to make that easy for you. And if you like programs like this, we encourage you to donate to help support this and other programs that we um, make available for JET alumni. I'd also like to do a little bit of housekeeping. I'd like to let you know that we still have slots available for our resume workshop. You can uh, do that on your own time and it concludes a resume review. And we also have career counseling program, which is currently full, but you can join the wait list in case we're allowed to add, or we're able to add some additional slots. I also want to let you know to please join us at the Transitions Career Event, which we are hosting with the Pacific Northwest um, JET Alumni Association. It's from September 20th to September 26th. And that event is a virtual event that will be different items every day that you will be able to take advantage of. Um, lastly, there is a Facebook group I think a lot of you might be interested in, JET Alumni in Policy and Government. And we'll put the link in the chat so you can join that Facebook group if you're interested. Now, without further ado, I'd like to thank our presenters for being here today, Catherine Tarr, Karen Kelly, and Michael Turner. Sorry, I'm going in the order that I'm seeing you on the screen. We're very excited today that Karen Kelly, the, uh, who's just finished her tour as Consul General in Osaka, will be giving a, um, a keynote speech. But before we get to that, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. I'm going to pull up the second slide. So during this event, we took um, questions in advance. We got a lot of great questions, which we'll be using for the panel at the end, but we will have some time, hopefully, to take additional questions. So if you'd like to answer a question, please use the Q&A setting, which is normally at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you're on mobile, you might need to tap your screen to be able to um, bring that up in order to do that. And if you have trouble with Q&A, you can always ask your questions in the chat box. Now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll get ready to hear from Karen Kelly. Bear with me just one second. Oops, sorry. I think I muted, unmuted. When you're unmuting. It's not working. Thank you, Karen. Sorry. All right. I'm going to go ahead and spotlight the video and I will turn it over to Karen Kelly. Good evening, um, all of you. I'm here on the West Coast in um, the Palm Springs area. So it is a late afternoon uh, tending towards evening here. Um, but I'm uh, really pleased to have this opportunity to uh, join you and would like to thank uh, the organizers for, from US Jet AA for the invitation and the opportunity to talk a little bit on this uh, subject of careers in the, in the foreign service. And as I was introduced, um, I have just uh, completed uh, my uh, three-year assignment in Osaka, Japan as the Consul General. For, West, for the Western Japan region. Um, it was a great job and I had a wonderful time uh, working with uh, colleagues like Catherine and Michael and um, having the opportunity to represent the United States in uh, Western Japan. Um, as um, I have come back to the United States now, it's been a little over two weeks uh, since I've been back from that assignment and I'm doing the, uh, the reverse uh, cross-cultural adjustment uh, to America, um, I have had a little bit of time to reflect on uh, the uh, most recently completed assignment. And so maybe I'll start by telling you a little bit about, about that, uh, that job and work my way backwards uh, to uh, the Foreign Service in general. Um, in Osaka, um, we uh, cover Western Japan region um, 
and that is the, uh, if you know Japan at all, and I think as Jet alumni you do, um, that is the Kinki, Shikoku, and Chugoku regions um, that are covered in, um, that, uh, in that consular district, which is about um, 17 prefectures um, that, um, that the consulate is responsible for. As Consul General, I serve as the Chief Executive Officer, if you will, um, for the mission. And our mission um, included 15 American officers and about 40 um, local uh, Japanese staff. Um, and our job uh, collectively was to represent uh, the United States um, in the Western Japan um, region. We had about, uh, I would say, three uh, main missions was to promote uh, economic and trade uh, relations between the United States and Japan, to uh, promote and advocate uh, support for the strong security alliance that we have uh, with, the, um, with the Japanese government um, through our militaries uh, cooperating together, and then to also uh, deepen our people-to-people -people relations uh, between Americans and Japanese. And so how did we do that? Um, we had a variety of activities and uh, programs that uh, supported our effort to do that. Um, in the Western Japan region, as in Japan in general, um, the U.S.-Japan uh, relationship is really greatly appreciated um, by a wide swatch of the population. There are people who remember um, having studied in the United States or having been exchange students in high school um, or having um, traveled to the United States. And so the US um, relationship is a very positive one overall. And um, the people um, in general have a great support um, for, um, for the United States and for the relationship with, um, with, with Japan. Um, where we find that there are challenges is uh, looking forward to the future. Um, that great relationship and all those great memories were forged by uh, the connections that were created through exchange programs and cultural events and tourism and travel. Um, what we're finding is that the younger generation of Japanese are uh, less inclined to have those kinds of experiences. And so one of the challenges is for us in, um, across Japan, not only in our consulate, is to, um, is to promote and advocate for firmer ties with the next generation, the successor generation, the next leadership um, uh, generation of Japanese. And so educational exchanges are something that um, we talked a lot about um, through our public affairs office. Um, we had uh, lots of opportunities to bring academics from uh, the United States to talk about their, their institutions and to talk about opportunities for study in the United States. Um, but we also had opportunities to engage with uh, professionals, young professionals, um, through our exchange programs like the International Visitor Leadership Program, which were short-term opportunities to travel to the United States to engage with professionals across a range of different, um, of different topics and um, to um, understand better how the United States meets and uh, addresses different, um, different issues. And so those programs um, continue. Um, and I will, um, I will let uh, Michael talk perhaps about uh, a little bit more about those kinds of programs. But as Consul General, um, my job was to manage all of the elements of the consulate and the American officers and the Japanese staff and to give them the, the wherewithal to carry out this effort to promote um, better relations with Japan. Um, we did a lot uh, because Western Japan is um, historically a trade area, uh, an area for commerce and trade in, um, in Japan. We did a lot in engaging with Japanese business, um, a lot um, through our American Chamber of Commerce, which has a chapter uh, in Western Japan, 
um, to promote and support the business exchanges, uh, not only American businesses coming to Japan, but also um, Japanese business interest, uh, interested in investing in the United States. Um, we promote agricultural products from the United States into the Japanese market. So we had a, a US um, agricultural trade office and through that office introduced um, people in Western Japan to American products um, that were coming, being imported into, um, into their local supermarkets um, and giving them the opportunity to understand uh, that the United States is a reliable partner for agricultural and food products um, in, the Jap in the Japanese market. So there, there was no one day that I could say is a typical day in the life of a consul general. I could be talking to a student group um, at a university and promoting study abroad, or I could be talking to a group of businessmen and um, promoting um, investment in the United States. Um, I could be in uh, a place like Kyoto and uh, taking part in a cultural exchange, um, or I could uh, be in the office writing up uh, a, a lot of paperwork in preparation for visits by our ambassador um, and other senior officers from our embassy in Tokyo. And I think that's part of what I enjoyed the most about the job was that one day was not like the other day and um, there could be a lot of interesting activities on the horizon whether they were uh, business related or whether they were cultural related or um, they involved uh, the uh, military installation in our consular district um, it was a range of different activities that brought me in contact with uh, different people and i think um, Looking back on my three years, um, of course, you can't complain when you work in an area that includes frequent uh, visits to places like Kyoto or um, Hiroshima or, uh, or Kobe. But I think that what was most memorable for me and what will always uh, be the most memorable part of the job was the opportunity to engage with people. Um, the opportunity to understand uh, the challenges that people are uh, confronting in uh, Western Japan where uh, these small towns are being hollowed out because students who study in uh, Tokyo find that they'd rather stay and live and work in Tokyo and they're not returning to their home, uh, their home um, towns and uh, creating uh, a, a drain, if you will, um, in the population and how these local townships are worried about that and how they're worried about meeting that or thinking about we're having discussions about uh, Japan's aging society and what will happen in the future um, and how will um, Japan's um, uh, economic uh, uh, economic opportunities continue uh, when we, there is a rapidly, the most rapidly aging society in, in the world currently. And how, how can they do that? Is it by bringing in, um, is it by bringing in uh, immigrant labor? And in a society like Japan, what are the implications socially um, for that? Uh, people are thinking about those kinds of things and um, having the opportunity to be a part of those discussions was something that I really found um, educational and, um, and, and highly interesting. So over the three years that I served in, um, in the um, consulate in Osaka as the consul general, I had those opportunities to travel throughout the region um, to have those meetings with local officials, with business leaders, with educators, um, to talk to artisans, um, including Americans who had come to Japan because they wanted to learn how to become um, potters and wound up spending 40 years learning the intricacies of Bizen pottery um, in Okayama, for example, um, to journalists and uh, to students. Um, it was a very enriching um, experience and um, 
it was a privilege to, um, to head that opportunity and to create for all of the American officers and the Japanese staff um, at the consulate, the opportunities to uh, deepen those relationships. Um, the other thing that I would say about the Foreign Service is that um, there are all kinds of opportunities to, uh, to fit in, if you will. Um, a few fun facts um, I, I compiled for, for tonight um, go, take us way back in history. Um, in uh, 1777, um, fun fact, Morocco was the first nation um, that sought diplomatic relations with the United States. And uh, Benjamin Franklin established the first overseas mission um, for the United States in Paris in, in 1779. Um, in April of 1782, it was John Adams who was received by the Dutch Republic as um, they were the first country uh, together with Morocco and um, France to recognize the United States as an independent government. The first overseas consulate um, for the United States was founded in uh, 1790 in Liverpool in Great Britain, which I think of more now as the home of the Beatles. But uh, the first American consulate in Japan was opened um, in a temple, uh, Gyokusenji in Shimoda in Shizuoka Prefecture. And uh, Townsend Harris was the American officer um, who headed that uh, consulate and who also headed the first legation, which is just a little bit under a full embassy um, in uh, 1959 in Tokyo. These um, early uh, relations with the United States have continued. And in fact, the United States is the country with the most uh, diplomatic uh, presence around the world. Um, we are in, I believe, 169 of the uh, UN countries and our embassies and consulates. I couldn't get a, an exact number, but let's just say it's a lot. Um, I think around 300 or so around the world. A couple of other fun facts. Um, the first woman um, in the Foreign Service was a, an officer by the name of Lucille Atcherson. Um, she passed the diplomatic service examination in 1922 um, with the third highest score, uh, thank you very much, and was assigned to Bern, Switzerland um, in 1929. She resigned her commission in 1927 in order to get married, which was a State Department policy at that time. And that policy that women who married needed to resign from uh, the Foreign Service, that continued until 1972, um, when the State Department lifted the policy as a result of a class action case that was brought by a Foreign Service officer, um, Allison Palmer. A woman by the name of Ruth Bryan Owen was the first woman uh, to be the chief of a US diplomatic mission, and that mission was Iceland. And Helen um, Moore Anderson was the first woman to hold the rank of ambassador, and that was in Denmark in 1949. Uh, Frances Willis was the first female FSO, Foreign Service Officer, to become an ambassador, and that was in 1953. Few other fun facts to throw at you. Um, a gentleman by the name of Ebenezer Don Carlos Bassett was the first um, African American diplomat. Um, in 1949, Edward Dudley was the first African American to hold the rank of ambassador. And a gentleman by the name of Clifton Wharton was the first African American to join the Foreign Service and was also the first African-American appointed as a chief of a diplomatic mission to a European country. Um, he was in Romania, um, appointed in 1958, 
and um, was also uh, after that um, the um, chief of the diplomatic mission in Norway in 1961. It would be uh, several years later that uh, Patricia Harris, Roberts Harris, a political appointee, um, was the first African American woman to hold the rank of ambassador. And she was the US ambassador to Luxembourg. I've noted these names um, of past foreign service officers and non-career appointees particularly the women and um, African Americans, because I believe that this is um, a very interesting time to be considering um, a career in the US diplomatic service. Um, in the wake of the George Floyd uh, murder in police custody in Minneapolis and all of the subsequent protests around the United States and indeed around the world, um, advocating for uh, social justice and equality. Um, we in the State Department and in our foreign affairs agencies um, in general are thinking about these issues of representation in our diplomatic service. And we're thinking specifically what initiatives um, we need to implement and to make a part of, of our culture um, organizationally so that we can ensure that the American diplomats that we send to represent our country overseas, around the world, um, will truly reflect the diversity that we are living here in the United States. There are a number of areas in which, if you're thinking about a foreign service career, you can point yourself. Um, there are there is information online um, in State Department careers that will talk about um, political um, reporting or economic reporting um, as a Foreign Service generalist. Um, you can also um, consider careers in our management field um, or in consular affairs, providing those services that were so important uh, in this time of COVID-19, our consular officers were really the unsold, unsung heroes and heroines um, in enabling um, American citizens around the world to be repatriated back to the United States uh, as the COVID-19 outbreak progressed around the world and air travel um, shut down. Um, a lot of our citizens abroad um, were um, stranded overseas. I mean, some of them were frankly stranded and it, were, it was the work of these consular officers um, working um, as they do um, in support of American citizens abroad who were able to, uh, through a variety of means, enable American citizens to, to repatriate and get home uh, to the United States. Our public diplomacy um, officers uh, are working in a variety of uh, programs and, um, and, and projects that expand the understanding between uh, foreign populace and the United States and uh, provide opportunities for uh, these greater exchanges that promote uh, greater understanding. And there are uh, areas of specialty in the Foreign Service as well. And all of that information is available um, online and, um, and, and through the resources that you have here on, on this panel. Um, so I won't go into um, all of the details about this, but I would just say that um, I have had um, a career that is now uh, 30 plus years um, long in um, the Foreign Service. Um, every day hasn't been a party but uh, most of my time in the service has been uh, extremely rewarding. Um, it is uh, quite an honor to represent uh, the American government and to uh, be a voice uh, for the American people uh, working overseas um, and uh, promoting better understanding uh, between foreign publics and uh, the United States government and American citizens. And so I would conclude by saying that it has been uh, the honor of a lifetime to have had a career in the Foreign Service. Most of that career has been spent overseas 
And most of that overseas uh, part of my career has been spent in Japan. And uh, so I'm a very big enthusiast on uh, Japan service, but I'm an even bigger uh, enthusiast on uh, representing the United States and uh, being a part of the diplomatic service. Um, I am uh, continually impressed with uh, my colleagues um, and sometimes wonder how did I get here because um, I would be hard pressed to find a smarter, uh, more uh, committed and uh, patriotic uh, group of people to be uh, colleagues with. And I have uh, greatly appreciated the opportunity to be one of their number in the diplomatic service. If you're thinking about um, becoming a diplomat, I say good on you. Uh, keep thinking about it, ask questions, and, uh, and, and do pursue that opportunity. It has been a, a gratifying uh, career for me, and I believe that for some of you out there uh, listening, it can be a gratifying um, experience for you as well. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, thank you so much, Karen. That was such an interesting, I, I learned a lot uh, about the history of the Foreign Service and many people I was not familiar with. So I, I'm looking forward to doing a little bit of research into these historical figures you mentioned. And also, I really enjoyed hearing about your experience um, as a Consul General of Osaka during this you know, very, very interesting time. Mm -hmm. We're really happy to have you with us today. And for those of you who are watching, I'm gonna recommend during this portion, if you have a choice, you should toggle to, from speaker view to the gallery view so that you will be able to see everyone all at the same time. And we're gonna switch over to a panel format. Um, so I'll ask that the panelists mute and unmute themselves and as needed. And we're gonna start in with a few um, prepared questions. Thank you all who submitted your questions during the registration. We got a lot of great ones and we're not going to be able to cover all of them. But for the ones we can't cover here, we're going to try to send out responses to the ones that we're able to answer after this. And the questions we have selected, I think uh, will do a good job of covering a lot of the different types of interests people were uh, wanted to hear about. So first, first question, and we'll go to Karen first, uh, since she's just been talking and she's already told us a lot about her own history. So rather than give us a whole brief introduction of your current or future assignment, which I will ask of the other panelists, I'd like if you could briefly talk to us about your path into the Foreign Service. What made you, what made you decide to go down that path and were there any um, specific milestones that you hit along the way? Thank you. Um, yeah, I was a Peace Corps volunteer out of uh, university, graduated um, uh, Syracuse University, go orange, and um, went into the Peace Corps and was, um, was, did my Peace Corps service as an English teacher and uh, was working in um, a second post-Peace Corps career as um, a, a uh, local hire American working for the British Embassy. Uh, let's put it that way. And um, giving out information on um, study in the UK and, um, and tourism in, in Britain. Um, one of the people who came in to get some information about, about tourism in, in, in Britain was the um, secretary to the US ambassador in the country that I was serving, which was Senegal in West Africa. And we started talking and she noticed right away that I'm not British. And um, I said, no, I'm an American. And uh, she wanted to ask a few questions. And then she invited me to lunch. And so the day we, we arranged for a day and we got together for lunch. And as I sat down to lunch, she pulled out a brochure and the brochure literally said, careers in the US Foreign Service. And she handed me the brochure and basically pitched the diplomatic service to me. And, based, and her, her pitch was, if you enjoy living overseas and learning new languages, um, 
your government has a job for you. And I took her brochure home and read through it. And I thought, hey, I, 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 I'm interested. Um, let me find out more. And that really started me. Um, it was not so much that I was, you know, calculating from university studies on through, um, through um, into, the, into the State Department, but it was, it was that someone took an interest in me and said, hey, have you thought about a career in the Foreign Service? And honestly, I hadn't. So um, uh, I can thank that, that, that individual for steering me in uh, my life's direction is what this has turned out to be. Thank you. Wow, it's, it's amazing how one person can kind of change the trajectory of your life. Um, I certainly had not planned to go on the JET program until my last year mm -hmm. of, of university. I hadn't even heard of it. And then now here there I am. There you go. So let's, uh, let's move on to the other panelists. Um, if you could, let, we'll start with Michael and then we'll go to, to Catherine, Kat. Um, please give a brief introduction of your current or upcoming assignments and your paths into the Foreign Service. Hi, thank you. It's, it's great to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and it's also a, a huge pleasure to be on the same panel with Kat and Karen Kelly. Um, I wish I could tell you about my next uh, career move. Uh, I'm in the middle of what we call bidding season right now, where Foreign Service officers all over the world are trying to find a, their next assignment. And it really is like a job hunt. So even though we have your career Foreign Service officers, for every new assignment, it's dust off the resume get out your personnel file, ask people to write letters of recommendations. And I've been doing that for the last couple of weeks, trying to find my next assignment post Tokyo. So I've been in Tokyo here for th more than three years. I finish up next summer. And my career in the Foreign Service actually began here at the US Embassy in Tokyo. I was on the jet program in Iwate, a buddy and I took the uh, overnight bus down here to Tokyo. I drank a lot of coffee at the 7-Eleven, went into the embassy that I work in today, took the written foreign service exam. Uh, I'm not sure how, but I passed, given that I hadn't had any sleep at all. And a year later, when I returned to the States, I took the oral exams. So it was a very different process back then uh, to get into the foreign service. Essentially, it was take the written, take the oral, uh, make sure you're not a criminal or a terrorist, uh, and that you're relatively healthy physically and mentally, and they would let you in. Uh, so I'm, uh, I feel uh, really blessed and honored to be back here in Tokyo where it all began for me. And so I say to uh, often, especially the folks from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and folks at the Ministry of Education, that I have them to thank for my career in the Foreign Service because it was <laughs> Jet, really, that brought me here. Uh, and this, uh, it's funny to see the reaction when I, when I say that. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, when I thank them for uh, my career and my path that has brought me back here to Japan. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Michael, for your story. Um, Kat, would you like to share your experience? Sure. Um, so right now, uh, I am a Korean language student. So part of the Foreign Service, um, in addition to serving overseas uh, and domestically, um, is being prepared for your next job. And that involves a lot of training. Um, I'll be joining our embassy in Seoul um, in their public diplomacy section in the press office in 2022. But before then, I've got two years of Korean to learn. So it's quite a commitment, but I'm very excited to have this opportunity. Uh, prior to this, I had just ended a job um, in DC in um, the State Department building in Foggy Bottom. Um, doing a job in public diplomacy on both the Japan and Korea desk. So I was really, uh, really happy to be able to work with Japan again. Um, my path to uh, the Foreign Service also led pretty much through JET. Um, I had studied Japanese in college, didn't study abroad, and um, I really wanted to use my Japanese, um, use my experience living overseas, and I was lucky enough to have a Japanese professor at the time who uh, led me to JET. And while I was a coordinator of international relations in Sendai City, I reached out to him again because in my second year, back then tours were limited to three years in JET. I didn't know exactly what it was I wanted to do next. Um, I knew I liked languages. I knew I was interested in foreign policy. I liked living overseas. 
And so that same professor actually led me uh, to apply to the Foreign Service. Um, much like Michael, my first time taking the test was at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo, but I didn't pass the first time. Um, but that taught me exactly what it is I didn't know and what I needed to learn um, and what was interesting to me. So I decided to go to graduate school at the Monterey, then called the Monterey Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California, um, where I graduated with an MA. And I pursued my career uh, in foreign policy while at the same time taking the Foreign Service exam again. Um, I finally entered the Foreign Service in 2011, and uh, from then on, I served in Shanghai, China, uh, Tegucigalpa, Honduras, most recently here in D.C., and I'll be taking off to Seoul next summer. Uh, great. Thank you so much. Um, somebody in the comment, in the questions, we're going to take most of the questions at the end, but Kat, you just started to talk about your experience with foreign language training, and that was one question that did came, come in. Would you mind maybe very briefly extrapolating a little bit on the foreign language training experience? Sure. Um, well, every job overseas is different. Um, obviously, you've got your different sorts of specializations, um, whether it's political, economic, public diplomacy, consular, or something in management. Um, so there's those type of practical knowledge, the kinds of practical knowledge you need to have before joining, um, taking on that job. But there's also some jobs that have a language designated, designation. And um, as a diplomat living overseas representing the US, you're expected to communicate with your um, foreign interlocutors primarily in the language that they use in that country. And so it depends on the job. Some jobs you don't have to learn a foreign language, some jobs you do. Um, I would say, you know, during your first two years, you absolutely have to learn at least one foreign language to come off to get what we call tenure in the foreign service and be able to move on in your foreign service career. Um, but that is part of, I think, the privilege of being a foreign service officer is um, getting to learn these foreign languages and getting to know cultures all around the world. Thank you so much, Kat, for expanding on that. Now I have a question for all three of you, and uh, I'd like to go to Karen first, and then we'll go in the same order, I guess, Michael, and then, and then Kat. But how has the current moment with the pandemic and protests for racial justice here in the US, how has that all affected US-Japan relations and foreign service positions in general? Got it. Um, great question. Thanks for that. Um, in terms of affected, um, I <clears throat> am thinking about <clears throat> how to respond to that, excuse me. Um, certainly, Japan and the United States have a wonderful, um, strong, uh, firm bilateral relationship. And um, I think that because Japan um, feels so uh, close to the United States, if you will, and such a partner to the United States, um, there has been uh, quite a bit of uh, dismay and surprise um, or uh, confusion about the social justice movement. Um, people in Japan who follow the United States, if you will, um, are uh, somewhat aware of the civil rights era um, and the movements then. And so, um, you know, you check the box. It's, yes, civil rights. There was Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, and now everything's okay, right? Um, so this latest movement for social justice and the protests are, um, are very, you know, are very surprising. And the, you know, a lot of what Japan, uh, the Japanese people understand about the United States is like uh, many other countries, including our own, is filtered through media. And so to the extent that media in Japan have focused on um, riots and have focused on um, looting, um, there are people in Japan who have looked at that and said, oh, this is about poor people trying to take advantage of a situation to get some things. Um, and I and I and I know that there was quite uh, some dismay with uh, some of the media that um, had covered um, the uh, the the George Floyd uh, protests and the Black Lives Matter movement. And 
Um, and when I say some dismay and some pushback, I'm talking about officially from our mission in, um, in, in Japan and an opportunity um, created for us to message uh, more uh, deeply on what is going on in the United States. And so one of, one of our roles as diplomats is to, is to be, that, be that explicator, if you will, to be uh, the presence who can in, expand the understanding of what people are seeing via their media or otherwise um, going on in the United States and to lend some nuanced understanding to that. And that is, in fact, what we um, what we were doing in um, in our embassies and consulates, uh, inviting people to uh, virtual discussions uh, to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement. So, how has it impacted us? It's given us an opportunity to talk a little bit more about uh, U.S. society, um, warts and all and to, uh, to give uh, our Japanese uh, partners an understanding that when there is something, when there is a situation in the United States and Americans see that there is a problem, um, it is our culture, it is part of our uh, society to speak up and to react to that and to try to uh, point to, to the problem and to uh, what we hope will be solutions. And so it's created that opportunity um, for us as, um, as diplomats. Um, as American citizens, of course, we are not, um, we're not immune to what's going on around us and including in the United States. And so I think there have been some internal discussions as well um, amongst us as, as, as American citizens um, as to uh, what's going on in our society and how um, we, in our role as uh, U.S. government representatives, can um, can bring about positive change. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to now go to, to Michael and then to Kat, and I would like if one of you as well could touch more on the pandemic aspect of the Foreign Service, uh, current situation in the Foreign Service and U.S.-Japan relations. Although, please feel free to add anything to what Karen was talking about, about this current moment in racial justice. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to, to what Karen said, other than the fact that I think uh, by talking about Black Lives Matter and about the movement in the States, we've given Japanese an opportunity to reflect on the, their own problems with race and ethnicity here in Japan. Uh, by talking honestly and openly about uh, our struggles and our, our systems and our failures and our successes in the States, uh, people are able to draw parallels. Uh, let me just talk very briefly about how uh, all that has worked uh, at a, from a technical level. You know, usually we do programs, when we say programs, speaker programs, as Karen had mentioned, where we bring in specialists, we get in an audience together, we're in an auditorium, we're in a seminar, we're in a lecture hall, whatnot. We can't do that with this pandemic. So we, we moved all our programs uh, online and they're all virtual just as we're doing here. And we have found tremendous success with that mm -hmm. because we're able to reach a nationwide audience. Uh, we were able to engage actually better uh, our Japanese audiences who are, are filling out the chat box with questions that they may not normally ask in public standing in front of a microphone. In fact, uh, a program that Karen initiated that became a countrywide program, our first big public program on Black Lives Matter, had uh, 800 people on Zoom tune in, and another 14,000 people saw it on Facebook Live. It was one of our biggest uh, programs, and there was intense interest in understanding what was happening in the United States, and we were able to use this platform to explain, uh, educate, uh, expand understanding. And I don't think we would have done that if... Um, if we didn't have this pandemic, we would have resorted to doing probably uh, let's get everyone into a hall and sit down and talk, uh, which has its advantages, of course. Uh, going forward, uh, we need to figure out uh, how do we balance the real world interaction that I think many of us as diplomats miss. As Edward R. Murrow said long ago, who was the head of USIA, it's the last three feet. And being in the same room with someone has uh, tremendous benefits. That tactile contact is critical to building a relationship. But the technology that we have today to uh, reach broad audiences and have a deep discussion are undeniable. So one of the challenges my team and I will have uh, once this is over with, as it will be, 
Uh, how do we maintain the two and balance that out? Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, that's a, que a question I have about what's going to happen with all this technology. We've mm -hmm. created these amazing spaces online. Are we going to be continuing them at the same level once we can go back to seeing each other in person? I'm, I'm very curious to see. Um, I'd like to turn to Kat and ask if you have anything to add. Sure. Um, I guess I'd really like to echo what Karen said um, about uh, the the period of, you know, racial uh, the unrest and um, the current problems that we're experiencing as a country, um, you know, uh, systemic racism, it's really brought um, this issue to the forefront and it's been an opportunity, an opportunity to discuss how we are not perfect and how we continue to strive to be better as a nation and that speaking up and out is part of um, American values. Uh, speaking to the pandemic part of the U.S.-Japan cooperation, um, we saw fantastic cooperation um, with the Diamond Princess cruise ship um, that was docked in Yokohama in the early days of the pandemic. Uh, we had close cooperation with our CDC and Japan CDC um, and made some early discoveries um, about the virus, which soon informed um, later engagements with, with such incidences. Um, and to be perfectly frank, it's, it's a challenging time to be a diplomat. Um, not only are you faced with not being able to do the sort of people-to-people in-person engagement that has been the foundation of your career, um, but you are having to explain certain facets of America that are frankly very difficult to talk about. Um, but I think it's given us a lot of opportunities to learn and grow professionally. But also as an institution, I think as we, um, as the State Department looks inwardly, um, everybody, every officer um, challenges themselves to think about the world in a new way, in a more equitable way, um, that we are trying to strive to become a more diverse and inclusive institution as well. Thank you all for your, your thoughts. Now I have a question specifically for Karen and then I have one that is for our JET alumni who are here today. Um, Karen, this was a previously submitted question. What advice do you have for other black women looking to join the foreign service? Uh, my advice is join. <laughs> um, I think that uh, the foreign service is a, a wonderful place for, um, for, for us. Um, as, as women, as black women, um, there is a wide world out there um, that is uh, open to getting to know you as a person um, and um, also um, is very interested in engaging with you um, as a professional diplomat. Um, I think if, that there is perhaps a tendency to uh, take the American experience and extrapolate on it worldwide. Um, and that would be a mistake. And what I mean by that is that I know that in our history, um, we have come from earlier times where we had a green book if we wanted to travel around the United States. There were places that were recommended you go and there were also places that you would not want to go um, as an African-American because it could be dangerous. Um, we should not look at the world in that same way. The, the world is not a green book um, in terms of where African-Americans are welcome and unwelcome. And um, if you think I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating, um, I remember very, very vividly uh, working in uh, Tokyo in one of my um, earlier assignments in Japan and having um, a phone call, uh, getting a phone call from um, an African-American woman um, who was on a business trip to Tokyo. And she knew someone who knew me, had met me in Japan and said, oh, there's this African-American woman in Japan. Why don't you reach out and touch her when you, when you arrive in Japan? And so this is what this, um, this woman had done. She had called and said, 
um, hi, I got your name from X and your number and I'm calling because I'm in my hotel and until I talk to you, I will not leave the hotel because I don't know if it's safe for me to walk around Tokyo. Now, anyone who knows anything about Japan would say, yeah, it's safe to walk in Tokyo. You can walk around Tokyo the way you probably can't walk around most American cities. Um, um, but uh, it struck me that here was this, here was this professional woman um, who had come from the United States, um, but she was looking for that kind of green book seal of approval. Um, yes, you're okay in this country. And so that's why I say that, you know, our American reality um, is not the basis for the way the world sees us or, or reacts to us. And so for the African Americans who are thinking perhaps that working abroad it might be more difficult than working in America, I would say not so. Um, I would say think that, think of, think that, think that idea over again. Um, and uh, don't allow our history um, to limit your, um, your possibilities in the world. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, but there are two questions I do want to get through. And some of them, I believe, do touch on questions that have come in onto the Q&A. So if those of you who are listening, we might run over a few minutes, but I'll do my best to keep us on schedule. So this next question is for Kat and Michael. Um, I guess we'll start with Kat this time. But what is one JET experience that you continue to reflect on and go back to to help guide you in your career? Well, I don't think that there's just one experience. Um, but if I have to say a general kind of experience on JET that continues to serve me well to this day, it's to be comfortable in the unknown. Um, to wake up every day and not know exactly what's going to happen to you at work, exactly what sort of questions people are going to ask you, um, not know what you're going to be asked to do, um, and to be okay with that. And, you know, whether it's in your, in foreign service, in your career, you know, you don't know exactly where you're going to end up in the next couple years. But um, you have to put your face in the fact that you love the job that you're doing, you love serving your country, um, you're excited about the fact that you get to live and work overseas. And um, that sort of excitement and, and just being comfortable with not knowing what's going to come next um, was an experience I had on JET and, and studying abroad in general uh, that continues to serve me as a foreign service officer. I agree. I agree 100% with Kat. Uh, in fact, that's what I was going to say. JET is a great training ground for getting you used to the unusual or, or the unknown and uh, keeping you flexible and understanding the need to be flexible when you're thrust into an environment that you may not completely understand because of cultural norms or languages. I remember on JET the first time uh, at a JET dinner with all my teachers and uh, so the, the dinner plate that was served me uh, started moving and uh, I didn't know how to react to living food uh, in front of me. Well, uh, that, that sort, that's sort of the foreign service in a nutshell. You just never know when your dinner is going to get up and skitter across the table, and you better be able to <laughs> handle that. Um, so exactly what Kat said. On top of that, I saw some questions about, uh, you know, do you, do you, how do you prepare for the foreign service? A jet is your training ground. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need to go to diplomatic school. You don't need to go get another government job. Uh, all those things are helpful, of course, but you don't have to do it. And I did see a couple of questions about uh, joining the Foreign Service later in your life or your career, and that we take, we take all comers. I think, and maybe uh, the others know better, I think the cutoff might be 50, 55, uh, I'm not 58. sure. 58. 58, I believe. Mm -hmm. Right, so that you can do at least, well, I think, uh, two tours or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, really, uh, in, when we talk about diversity, it's not just... Uh, you know, the color of your skin, your background, your religion, it's, it's your age. Because uh, young Foreign Service officers bring a different perspective, but incoming older Foreign Service officers mm -hmm. who have had experience in the private sector, for example, are also extremely important. So when we talk about diversity, it's, uh, it's everything. 
uh, you know, roll the dice and pick your diversity thing. But that certainly includes uh, welcoming uh, older applicants into the Foreign Service. Well, that's really the perfect segue to my final question um, to address some of these that we've got both beforehand and that are currently in the Q&A box. But what advice would you give to those who are interested in applying to become a Foreign Service officer? And does that advice differ for those who are coming just out of debt versus a mid-career individual, you know, ages 30 to 45? I guess we'll go to Karen first and then go back. Sure. Around. Yeah, I would say for people coming out of JET, I mean, I know that you are in love with Japan um, and you know I empathize with that love. Um, but I would say as far as the Foreign Service career is concerned, um, don't, uh, please don't get wedded to the idea that you have brought all this Japan experience into the Foreign Service and so obviously you're going to be in Japan. You've got Japanese language, skills, and so of course they're going to send you to Japan. Um, in fact, uh, your first, um, your first uh, assignment in the Foreign Service is unlikely to be Japan. Um, and there are a number of people who have come from uh, experiences of living and working in Japan and have entered the Foreign Service uh, to uh, get to a Japan assignment years later, if ever. Um, so the Foreign Service is not the fast track to an official job in Japan, um, is what I would say. Um, we are called on to be worldwide available, and uh, the Foreign Service really means it when they say worldwide. <laughs> um, they mean for you to, you know, go around the world. I mean, I have been a little bit of an uh, anomaly, if you will, in uh, these repetitive Japan assignments. And of course, um, it makes sense because I was a French major in university. And so <laughs> that's kind of the way it works. Um, but uh, if you are willing to experience the world, then the Foreign Service would be a great career for you. Um, um, if you kind of got it in your head that you can only go to a handful of places, um, that might be the start of some enduring frustrations with the career. Uh, go ahead, Michael. If you have anything else. Uh, to no, no, it, 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 Karen's absolutely right. You need to be worldwide available. I think yeah, I'm extremely lucky uh, to be here at this point in my career as the cultural and uh, the sports attache at the Embassy of Tokyo, but that's certainly there was no guarantee that I was going to get that mm -hmm. job, this job that I have right now. So I'm very lucky. Um, yeah, you really never know where you're going to end up. Uh, I've been lucky. I've, been, I've had great assignments. Uh, and as I think Kat said earlier, every assignment is different in terms of what your, your mission is in that country, how you interact with the host nation and uh, your goals. And as a representative of the United States government advocating for our foreign policy, it's different in every country. And so the makeup of our mission is different in every country. Mm -hmm. And Karen's right, if, if, you, if you want to stay just in Japan, then perhaps the Foreign Service is not for you. But if you're ready to travel the world uh, and uh, suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, but also to reap the amazing benefits mm -hmm. of this career, then the Foreign Service is for you. Kat? Yeah, ditto. I would say do your research, um, you know, so you know exactly what it is that you want to do or what about the Foreign Service appeals to you. Um, there are some great resources out there. Careers.state.gov is the first place you should go to learn more about Foreign Service careers because no two careers are alike, as you've seen with all three of us and, and the various places we've been to and our various paths in getting here. Um, and if you think you still might be interested, uh, there's a book that I recommend you read called Inside a U.S. Embassy, which is kind of the definitive guide to what it's like to work in an embassy, how they're organized, and it's a good primer to what foreign service life is like. Um, and then if you still think it's for you and you find a cone or a specialization that you like, my final piece of advice would be persistence. Um, I took the test multiple times before I pass. And in the meantime, you know, I, I, what I always tell people who ask me about it, I always say, if you're interested in the Foreign Service, it should be your plan B. So you should have a plan A that incorporates all of the things that you want out of a Foreign Service career or what you like about this lifestyle and build a career based on that. 
and then eventually you will join the foreign service or you won't but at the end of the day you'll be happy um, with your work and what you've chosen to do with your life thank you all very much um, we i tried to address weave in as many of the q a's as we could get to but we're unfortunately out of time but for those of you who had questions we didn't answer, both submitted before and submitted now, we will be compiling those questions and trying to find some answers either from our presenters or there's some resources that we can refer you to online that we will include in the email we send out with the recording. So don't worry, we will provide some additional insight for these questions we were not able to get to. Get to. Um, Bahia, um, since it's early morning for me and I've, I'm jacked up on coffee, I'm happy to stay a little longer because um, my day's just begun. So uh, if you've got the bandwidth for maybe 10 more minutes, I'm happy to stick around and answer as many questions as I, as I can. Uh, it, this is a great excuse for me to avoid, uh, don't listen to this, Karen or Kat, this is a great excuse <laughs> to avoid uh, some, other, uh, some other meetings that are on my calendar today, which uh, maybe are, are not as interesting about talking than, uh, than this. So uh, happy to uh, engage further for another 10 or 15 if there's interest. All right, well, um, maybe we can have time for a lightning round and uh, <laughs> anyone who can take it can take it and we'll, we'll try to go um, quickly if we can. Um, so let's see. All right, we've had some mention about not necessarily going to Japan if that's the country you hope you go to. And we did have a question about foreign service officers doing a tour or two in hardship places. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit uh, about what it's like to serve in one of those places? And just whichever you wanna take this question. Sure, I'll, um, I'll jump on the hardship question because there are hardships and then there are hardships. Um, for example, I had um, three hardship assignments um, and uh, they were um, Manila um, in the Republic of the Philippines, um, um, Z Harare, Zimbabwe in Southern Africa, and um, uh, Yaoundé, Cameroon in, in West Africa. Um, and what made them hardship assignments were, you know, very different factors. Um, uh, sometimes it is, you know, the, the adequacy of medical care um, uh, and infrastructure in the country compared to the United States. Um, sometimes it is a level of uh, violence, um, political violence, um, that will factor into whether a country is designated hardship or not. Um, but uh, there are, you know, and then there are those, those one year assignments um, that are the hardest of our hardships, if you will, um, in places like Kabul, um, Afghanistan, or in, um, in, in, in Islamabad, Pakistan, um, and uh, several other places around the world where um, there, there are, you know, there are difficulties um, living and those and those and those places are um, families are not uh, are not allowed to accompany you on on those assignments. So hardship can be uh, a, a spectrum and uh, there can be a hardship designation um, for a country that you would say, hey, I'll, I'll go there, I, I'd go to the Philippines. I mean, what's so hard about living in Manila with Starbucks at every street corner? Um, <laughs> but um, there are other hardships um, uh, associated with being in, in, in that particular location. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a spectrum, I would say, and um, your experience there will be, um, will be, will be dependent on the country that, that you um, select to serve in. Thank you. Um, next que question and lightning round. Um, is a master's degree required or helpful in your career with the Foreign Service? Not required. Not, the only thing that's not, required, I believe, is a high school diploma. Okay. Does it help? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different master's degrees and so many paths mm -hmm. to take. And then what do you, I mean, maybe it's hard to say, honestly, I think your experience as a person and your perspective is what's important, not so much a degree or, or a label right. or a credential. I would agree with that. I would say that, you know, expressing yourself, um, 
not only orally, but also in written form is, is very important. And um, if you um, have uh, good writing skills, I mean, you can write well and you can write quickly, um, that is a great skill to cultivate um, as a foreign service mm -hmm. officer, because there is, depending on the position, there can be a lot of writing um, that goes on in, 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 in preparing briefing papers um, and other documents uh, for, uh, as, as, as in the course of your work. Um, so uh, yeah, the, I think the, the education um, is helpful in the sense that for in a place like Japan, for example, a lot of the people that we are engaging with are um, have have done graduate studies in the United States, um, and so it is helpful to understand what they are looking for and what they experienced in their in their um, education. Um, but um, it's not required. It is not required. Um, but having Having a good having a good speaking um, speaking ability, a good um, writing um, skills, and um, uh, a a critical mind um, are invaluable. And if you pick that up while you're studying at university, great. But um, if you have picked that up over the course of living as a person on Earth with an interest in the world, um, even better. Thank you. Um, how do you navigate having a spouse or family while serving in the Foreign Service? Very good question. <laughs> you do it, you do it as diplomatically as you can. Um, I, <laughs> I raised two children um, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, as, with my career. And it was, you know, it was, it was, it was hard. Um, I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, it was, it was difficult. Um, I was fortunate in that I had two very active, healthy um, sons who uh, were open to traveling and leaving friends in past uh, iterations, in past countries, and going um, and making friends in new places. Um, some kids are not as adaptable. Um, and then you may have uh, a situation where um, you have children who have special needs that can't be met in an overseas assignment. Um, the State Department is uh, very flexible, um, I would say in general, about um, looking at your situation and working with you to help you develop a career um, in, in, in addition to, in consideration of all of your personal family um, experiences. Spouses, um, it's, it can be difficult. Um, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it here. It can be difficult. Um, spouses expect to work and expect to have meaningful um, professional work to do. And depending on the country that you go to, that might not be available. And so there is a give and take um, in marriage in general, um, and especially, I think, in foreign service marriages. Do either of you want to add to that? No, that's it. Um, yeah, just uh, to put in a plug, I don't have any children myself. I do have a husband and two cats, and just to say that pets you can have pets in the foreign service. There's definitely places you cannot take certain animals for specific reasons, but um, the foreign service uh, has grown in a lot of ways over the past couple decades. And one of the ways it's grown is in support for those bringing animals overseas as part of their family. So right. that is something that we, we all do and it's a part of our lives as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, okay. Now we really do need to end. It is, it is 9, 10 p.m. on the East Coast, and uh, we need to let Michael get his day started. Um, <laughs> but I really want to say we, we appreciate so much all of you, you know, being here and joining us tonight. I know I learned a lot, and I, I'm sure our participants did as well. Um, we will be doing a follow-up networking session at some point, probably in early October. We're still working on finalizing the date um, for that, but I know we focused on the experience of the Foreign Service Officer with the State Department, but there's lots of other 
similar jobs with the civil service and foreign service, I believe, with other um, branches. Again, not my area of expertise, but we hope to bring some of the JET alumni who are doing those other things all together for a networking session. So please uh, just keep an eye out. We will be sending that out um, with the recording and the answers to some of these other questions. And again, we will be trying to answer all of the questions that we didn't get to in a written format when we send out the recording. So thank you all again. Uh, we can't do a round of applause for our speakers because you know, we can't see you, but I like to think you're all applauding um, from your own home behind the screen that we can't see you. And I just wanna say thank you so much to Karen, Michael and Kat, Kat for being here today and joining us on this webinar. Thank you, it was a lot of thank fun. Thank you. Thank you, Bahia.